So, the ninth commandment. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, I want you to know that while this commandment may sound like it's just about one thing, it's actually about a bigger thing. And what it's actually about is truth. So let us consider a couple definitions for truth. The first one, truth is fidelity to an original. Now, let me give you an example to help explain that. So, some of you may remember, as I do, back around the mid-1980s, that if you were a Coca-Cola drinker, Coca-Cola suddenly came out with New Coke. And uh, the reason they did that is because Pepsi was starting to edge into their market share a little bit, and they got worried. And they thought, we probably better adjust our formula to taste a little more like Pepsi so that we can stave this off. So they changed their formula and they came out with new Coke. Well, people were not thrilled. People liked their Coca-Cola the way it was. And so when this new Coke came out, people weren't real happy about it and they complained about it to the company and the company eventually got the message and so they came out and said, well, we'll give you classic Coke. Classic Coca-Cola will be the original formula and, and you can have that. And for a while they tried to have both new Coke and classic Coke at the same time. Well, that only lasted for so long because most people didn't really like the new Coke. They wanted their original formula. It was very important to people that the Coca-Cola they were drinking was the original formula. So much so that when classic Coke came out, some people actually kind of were skeptical whether or not that was really the original formula or if they just made something else and were trying to pass it off on. Well, eventually, I think people accepted that it was the original formula, and it, it went over fine. And you probably remember that for many, many years, Coca-Cola had classic on there. Even though New Coke, because it didn't go over that well, eventually faded out. I don't even know how long it lasted, maybe a year or two. But we still had classic Coke for a long time after that. Um, and eventually they just did away with the plastic, and it was just Coca-Cola again. But this whole thing points to the fact that the original was very important to people. They wanted to know that the Coca-Cola they were drinking was the true Coca-Cola, the real Coca-Cola. Remember the slogan used to be the real thing? People wanted the real thing to be the real thing, right? <laughs> They didn't want no substitutes. Well, fidelity to an original is that very notion. That's why it's a definition for truth. It means that if you set two, two bottles of Coca-Cola down there, and one's the original formula and one's a new formula, the people who want the real thing, the true Coca-Cola, are going to want the one that's the original. And so, that's one way we understand truth. Truth can only be defined by this next definition. Truth is that which is true or in accordance with fact or reality. You can't have something that's not fact or reality be true. Now, I know that idea is very unpopular in today's society. In our current culture, we like the idea of truth being relative. 
We like the idea that you can have your own personal truth and that your truth and my truth, whatever they may be, can be equally valid. That's why you see so much stuff going on in society today that doesn't make sense. They're calling things one thing when they're not, and we know they're not, but we're supposed to pretend like they are. That's because our society no longer values truth. Well, that's what this commandment is really about. Truth. You see, this whole idea that truth is relative and that you can have your own personal truth doesn't fit with the definitions we just looked at. Whatever truth is, it has to be real, it has to be factual. So now, remember that these Ten Commandments, all of them, are foundational to a healthy and good society. We cannot accurately assess right from wrong or good from bad without being able to depend on truth. We have to be able to know what's true in order to determine right from wrong, good from bad, reality from fantasy. So let's break down some of the things that this commandment means. Now, getting back to what I originally said, where we might think this commandment was just about one thing, well, let's take the obvious interpretation that most people would generally take. It might be our assumption that this commandment is really only about giving false testimony in a court of law. For example, saying that you saw your neighbor steal something and testifying to that, even though you actually know that your neighbor didn't steal that thing, but you're going to say that he did because you don't really like your neighbor and you're okay with the idea of him having to suffer for something that he didn't do. Um, so you're perfectly willing to give false testimony to help make him suffer because yeah, you don't like him. And this command commandment can and certainly does refer to that sort of thing. Justice is very important to God, and it's very important to our ability to have a healthy society. Without the hope of just and fair outcomes in a court of law, a society cannot be peaceful, and people cannot be safe or free. So important, in fact, is the subject of honest witnesses to God that this provision is included in the law. Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 21. We'll start with this part. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. So great was God's concern over the possibility of false witnesses that he required that there be at least two or three or more witnesses to condemn a person who's been accused of a crime. Now the passage goes on and says, if a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judge shall, re shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. That's right. 
If you falsely accuse someone of a crime and you're caught doing that, your punishment for doing that is going to be the same as what would have been the punishment for the person that you falsely accused. Now that's pretty serious. Because say that person's been accused of something that may involve the death penalty. Some breaking some of the laws that God gave did involve the death penalty. So if you accuse somebody that way and it turns out that you're a false accuser, that's right. It will be you being put to death rather than the person you falsely accused. That's how serious God takes it. Let's look at Exodus 23, verses 1 through 3, and then 6 through 7, for some more insight on how God feels about anyone being a false witness. It says, Do not spread false reports. Do not help a guilty person by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in wrongdoing. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. And do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. Now that means just because they're poor. You know, don't take pity on a poor person just because they're poor and you're thinking, well, they're poor and they deserve something. So, you know, I'll side with the crowd here and take pity on them. And, you know, it doesn't really matter what's true or what justice is. He's saying don't do that. At the same time, picking up in verse 6, it says... Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. So by the same measure, you don't want to look at somebody and say, just because they're poor, we're not going to take them seriously. You know, maybe they are uh, been wronged by somebody who's rich. And while we, we have more respect and concern for the rich person than we do the poor person, so by the same measure, it's saying, don't deny justice to a poor person. It says, have nothing to do with a false charge and do not put an innocent or honest person to death. For I will not acquit the guilty. Now, as I suggested earlier, this commandment is about more than just honesty in a court of law. It's about the foundational value of truth. Grab a quick drink here. Many of the world's great evils were accomplished because people were deceived. Slavery, for example, and we're talking about the kind of slavery where people were bought and sold, and they had no rights. That's the kind of slavery we're talking about. We're not talking about indentured servitude like we talked about before. That's the kind of slavery we see in the Bible that the Bible seems to be okay with, and it, it messes people up because they think the Bible's okay with slavery, and when we think about slavery, we think about, well, first and foremost, what was done to African Americans in our country, and we're thinking, wow, the Bible's okay with that? No, the Bible's not okay with that. The Bible talks about indentured servitude. That's where a person would sell themselves into service to another person in order to alleviate a debt. No, this here, the kind of slavery where people are bought and sold and their rights are taken away, that the Bible calls evil. But that kind of thing came about because somebody deceived other people about people's worth, you know? Whether it was black people or Irish people. Irish people were bought and sold in slavery as well. A lot of people don't realize that, but they were. Or if it was the people, the Jewish people, who were slaves in Egypt, had less value. You know, whatever people group you were part of that was being bought and sold in slavery and your rights were taken away, it's because somebody was saying, hey, because this person's such and such a thing, 
they have less value than I do or we do. That's a lot. And if our understanding of truth is built on biblical foundational truths, we would know that nobody among us has less value to God. And so we wouldn't treat other people like they can be bought and sold. Now, during the Holocaust, millions of Jews died because the German people were convinced by people like Hitler that Jewish people had less value. All Aryan or other people were able to be put to death because of deception, because of a lie. And you know what? It has to be understood that the people who believe these lies and were okay with this kind of stuff happening, we can even look back in our own country's history and people who owned slaves, they didn't think of themselves as bad people. They didn't think of themselves as dishonest people. They didn't think of themselves as evil people. A lot of these people in Germany who allowed Hitler and, you know, all of them to do the things they did, they weren't thinking of themselves as bad people. They were just deceived. And because they didn't have biblical foundational truth built into their lives, they were able to be deceived about other people's value. So, if we need further evidence that lies are at the heart of this commandment, let's look at Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. And we read this. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who brings out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Of these seven things the Lord hates, at least two of them are directly referring to lies. And a third, the person who sows discord among brothers, you know, they're probably accomplishing that by gossip or something, lying about somebody. You know, that's how you sow diversity. You make one side believe that the other side, that they're bad. And a lot of times that's accomplished by telling lies or gossip or that sort of thing, right? So probably three of these things that the Lord hates have to do with lies. And that brings me to my final point on this commandment. What about gossip? Could gossip have something to do with bearing false witness? Let's look at Matthew 12, 36. It says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. See, the trouble with gossip is that they're careless words. And they may or may not true, be true. A lot of times we don't even know. If we're gossiping, we're not even sure if it's true or not. We're just sharing the information because it's juicy, <laughs> you know. And uh, but we're not sure if it's true or not. But the thing is, when we spread it around, it becomes slander. And that's not good. Because when we're slandering people, we damage their reputation. And we might be damaging their reputation over something that's not even true. Gossip tends to be included on some not very nice lists of bad things people do, such as Romans 129. says, They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, they are full of envy, murder, strife, 
deceit, maliciousness, they are gossips. Now you got that list all filled with all these terrible things, and then the last thing it says is they are gossips. Wow, gossip gets tacked on to this list of all these other really bad things. Hmm, there must be something pretty bad about gossip. Maybe we're breaking a commandment when we do that. And also 2 Corinthians 12, 20. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. So again, we have the Apostle Paul expressing that there he might find among the Corinthians all these negative things that he hopes not to find, and among them on that list is gossip sitting right next to slander. I think that's probably not by accident. When we gossip, we deal carelessly with the truth, and we put the reputation of our friend or neighbor at risk. It's not the loving thing to do, and it is just another form of bearing false witness. Truth is of the utmost importance and value to us as a society and in the world. Without truth, we cannot understand God, the world he created, or even ourselves. That is why the Bible is called the Word of Truth in 2 Timothy 2.15, and we're advised to study it. God wants us to know the truth, speak the truth, and live by the truth. Without the truth, we cannot make sound judgments, neither about the things of heaven or the things of earth. And we will not have a just and free society. As Jesus said in John 8, 32, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Why does the truth set us free? Because when we are in lies, when we're believing lies, when we have a foundation of lies, we are in bondage. Because all those lies are going to lead us to sin. And sin puts us in bondage. All right. Exodus 20, 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, or his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You know, the Tenth Commandment is the only one of the commandments that deals with our thoughts rather than our actions. Why does this matter? Because it's bad thoughts and bad desires that can lead us to bad actions. It's been that way since the beginning. The very first sin humankind ever did was preceded by a bad thought, which turned into a bad desire, and which led to a bad action. Let's look at Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. 
Now, fast forward thousands of years later, and we find the Apostle James writing the following in his epistle. James 1, 13 through 15. When tempted, no one should say, God has tempted me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. You see, coveting is the reason we do bad stuff. And when properly understood from the Hebrew, coveting is stronger than just things like envy or lust. Envy and lust speak to the desire to have something, but coveting actually goes beyond that. Coveting goes to the point of actually planning, how can I have that? Setting a plan in motion, really, to take it. Now, last week I talked about adultery, and I made reference to King David and his being on the rooftop observing Bathsheba bathing. Without question, he knew he desired her and wanted to have her, but even with that, he could have chosen to do the right thing and walk away. He didn't. Instead, he began to make a plan for how to actually obtain her, a plan that led to him not only committing adultery, but also murder. Before he broke the sixth and seventh commandments, he had to break the tenth. That's what it means to covet. To want and desire so bad that it takes over your heart and your mind, and you're willing to risk everything to obtain it. It's what happened to David. It's what happened to Adam and Eve. It's what happens to us when we choose to go back to our sin. A thing can be off limits to us because it belongs to someone else, or a thing can be off limits to us because God says, that's not for you, my child. And in those cases, it's up to us to trust his judgment. Now, desire in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. That's why the commandment is really about more than just desiring something. For example, let me tell you a little something. When I was a young man, and fairly new in my Christian walk, I met older godly men, and I learned from them. And I found that oftentimes these older godly men had godly wives. And as a young man, starting to walk in the faith and learning about God and seeing these older men that I respected, and they had these great wives. And I thought to myself, I'd like to have a wife like that. Now, that didn't mean I wanted to take their wife, but it meant I wanted to be the kind of godly Christian man who could find a good, quality, godly woman like that. And that's not a bad thing. To see something that you think is really great and it makes you want to be better so that you can have something like that. Same thing goes if you see somebody who's got a nice house, a nice car, and you think, wow, I'd like to have that. Now, if you set out a plan to steal it, <laughs> well, you're coveting. But if you stop and think to yourself, how can I work harder and more responsibly so that, you know, I can earn things like that, have a better life? That's not a bad thing. That said, if we give so much of our time and effort and energy into pursuing those nice things that it kind of takes over, and comes at the detriment of quality time with our family or our wife or, or our friends, 
then it does become a bad thing. And it kind of ends up going back to uh, breaking the command about taking a Sabbath. Because part of what it meant to take a Sabbath was to take downtime so you can have quality time with God and your family and your friends. So there's a balance in there. But all that just to say, desire is not necessarily a bad thing unless we let it run rampant or unless it becomes coveting and we desire to specifically take that which belongs to somebody else or that we know is not for us because God said no. So again, this commandment is about what we do with our minds. The Apostle Paul gives us this advice in Colossians 3, 2 through 5. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires and covetousness, which is idolatry. To see that? To covet is to commit idolatry, according to Paul right there in Colossians. This helps us understand both commandments better. To truly covet is to want something so bad you are willing to make it more important than your devotion to God. Galatians 6, 8 says, Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. My friends, let us be children who sow to please the Spirit. Let us use these Ten Commandments to consider how our ways still fall short of the glory of God. We who have the Spirit of God living inside us are compelled by that same Spirit to pursue the image and likeness of Christ. We can use these commandments, as well as other things the Bible teaches us, to measure ourselves and take stock of both how far we have come and how far we still have to go. We are righteous by the blood of Christ, but at the same time, we want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may test and approve the perfect will of God. That's from Romans 12, 1 and 2. He didn't just call us to be saved by grace. He also called us to be transformed by love. Love for God and love for our neighbor. This gets us back to Jesus saying, if we love God and love our neighbor, we'll keep all the commandments. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to want to take his stuff. You're not going to want to covet that which belongs to him. That's not love. For God, for our neighbor. So let's examine ourselves. We're heading into Holy Week. Let's examine ourselves. Let's take stock. Let's look at this stuff. Where do we still fall short? Let's lay it at the feet of Jesus, repent of it, and move forward in Christ. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you. We thank you for these Ten Commandments that we have studied over these weeks. And we thank you for all the things that they have taught us. How they have helped us to reflect on our own hearts and our own minds, our own lives, and what's still going on in us. Lord, search us and know us. Help us to be true to you. Thank you, in Jesus' name. There we go. All right. Now we
we have hymn 113, The Old Rugged Cross. <laughs>
of the Holy Spirit and united with all our brothers and sisters in Christ as we move forward in Christ together.